I've only got one life. I may as well live it to the full and enjoy it the best I can because, um, you know, I'm not looking forward to the afterlife when things can be peaceful or anything for me. It's what happens now. And, yeah. I grew up in the country, in, in Lincoln and Canterbury, and we used to spend holidays at times in lakes like, on the shores of lakes like Wanaka, and they were happy memories. But then when I went to university, I was doing, I'd done both botany and zoology, and then I was going into my fourth year and, and had to make a choice of which one I wanted to do. So. I went into zoology and it was during that time that I first met limnology, which was a course that Veda Stout was teaching there about lakes and ponds and freshwater environments. And I got very interested in this. There was also the marine that I was learning about, marine areas, and was very interested in that. But then I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to take me overseas but the PhD didn't um, start until much later the following year and so I had this time to fill in and during that time I worked for Vida you know as a sort of a, a student helping her out as a research assistant and we went to lakes up in the northern Canterbury area and worked and more and more I became you know fascinated with fresh waters so then when I went overseas uh, to do a PhD I had to make this decision of whether to do it marine or fresh water but I wanted to be my own person as it were able to do all the boat work required for working in an aquatic environment and, and to be able to uh, control when I would go out and do the sampling and things. And in New Zealand at the time there weren't any research vessels to take students out, they just had to be reliant on fishermen. And of course the fishermen had their own livelihood to deal with and so you always had to pay sort of um, second fiddle to them. I thought, well, fresh water would be a lot easier because, you know, I can row a boat, I could go out and sort of really have more control over things. And the other reason I thought is, you know, New Zealand's got all this wonderful fresh water and everyone said that, you know, it's fine, we've got all this bountiful fresh water. But growing up, as I did in the South Island, I sort of realised that yes, we had quite a bit of fresh water, but you know, we had to drive right into central Otago to get, you know, real lakes rather than the very shallow sort of um, uh, odd lake that we would get on the east coast of the Canterbury, you know, Otago sort of North Canterbury area. I realised that our fresh water was all over in the Fiordland area. This is South Island fresh water and whatever, and I thought, hmm, I think it would be really interesting to look at the freshwater environments, how they work, but also, you know, what's going to be happening to them in the future. So I chose freshwater and went over to Canada, worked in lakes and freshwater environments there, and when I came back then, um, I got a job in Otago University, and more and more I was finding myself going inland to the lakes here. The more I learned about what was going on in the rest of the world in terms of the diversity of freshwater environments they had, the more I realised that New Zealand was really special as a country because it had examples of just about every sort of lake. But the real advantage we've got is that it's all crammed into one small pair of islands, as it were. 
these deep lakes like Wanaka, Wakatipu, you know, Manapuri, um, Tiana, those lakes, and then going up the Pukaki, uh, Tikapo area there, a lot of them were virtually, if not unique in the world, in their depth and some of the things that were going on internally in the lake, their water clarity. And you can actually see, well, you can see to a great depth, and anything that um, upsets that clarity or modifies it in any way, like a lot of sediment coming in can do it, but um, primarily the one that one is most worried about in terms of um, in terms of sort of natural um, pollution, is how some people term it, is the massive plant growth, like the algal blooms will then make the water more turbid, which means you reduce the um, incident light penetration in the water. Mm. I think one of the important things to realise, and it actually was a little while before I realised that in terms of, you know, my, my um, career in, as a limnologist, is that you can't divorce a lake from its catchment. I mean, let's face it, it's, the lake is like that little ring in the bottom of a saucer, you know, <laughs> where all the tea, if you've spilt it, collects. That's what a lake is, it's a collection for a whole lot of runoff that comes from the catchment, as well as, of course, water that falls in from the sky, <laughs> just rain and things like that. But a large proportion comes from the catchment, and that means what's going on in the catchment is going to have a great influence on what type of the quality of the water that is in the lake. So that's why, <laughs> a very long story, but that's why I'm really, really particularly concerned because I live in Otago about the Otago, Canterbury, Southland, deep lakes. I'm also concerned about the shallow lakes and a lot of the other lakes in New Zealand very much so, but these ones are in my back door as it were, and so I'm particularly concerned about them. Back in about 1971, a colleague and I had been working on Lake Hayes and Lake Johnson, a little lake nearby, both of which are about, um, well, Lake Johnson's 28 um, metres deep, uh, Lake Hayes 33, so they're, you know, they're not small in terms of their depth and they're relatively large in terms of their area. Many people know Lake Hayes as a sort of one of these iconic uh, lakes that appears on calendars and everything because it's very picturesque near, near Queenstown. We'd been studying these sort of systematically, monthly, taking measurements of um, various aspects of, one might say, the water quality of them and also the temperature profiles and things like that. And it was very obvious then that those lakes were having very, very bad cyanobacterial blooms in them to the point where the, the few people who lived around them were sort of saying, you know, these blooms, can, can you do anything, would say to us, can you do anything about them? We were commissioned by Ministry of Works and Development in those days, which was also the organisation that was responsible for sort of water um, and lakes at that time in New Zealand, to do a report um, and to give recommendations as to how the water quality in these two lakes might be improved. And we came out with sort of three potential um, options that you know you might choose. The flushing one seemed certainly the most viable one, but the problem was 
Although there was a source of pure water from the Arrow River that would have been just diverted a bit in pipes, the pipes were already there, um, to flush out Lake Hayes. Um, it was considered that it was more important that that water be completely abstracted on its way to Lake Hayes to use for farming. Well, about twenty, nothing happened then, and then about oh, I suppose it was twenty years later. <laughs> sort of the wheel turned full circle and another report was commissioned, this time by another agency. The um, recommendations turned out to be the same. And again, I don't know, everything was sort of put on hold. There were more important things to do and nothing happened. And then about 20 years after that, it all came round full circle again. The same recommendations came out and nothing happened. But now the local people around the lakes are saying, look, something needs to be done. And they have sort of banded together and paid for a few, um, you know, reports to be done and investigations to be done. So um, I guess it's a sort of cynical view that um, it's probably human nature that nothing actually no action will be taken and things will get done until it is right up in your face and simply there's no option you have to start taking action because otherwise you know it's just going to get beyond um, one's ability to do anything to manage the situation. something I've thought about quite a bit. At times it seems as though, yes, the more people know about sort of science and fully understand it, then the more receptive they are to the ideas and, and you know, go along with them. And then at other times I feel that um, maybe there is, worldwide I might say, a sort of anti-science faction that seems to exert its influence at times and and that worries me but um, maybe this is just the way people are and always have been there will always be you know for every reaction a sort of anti um, reaction I like to hope that the new generation coming on is going to be a lot more aware of looking at things from a more scientific approach and if they've got the evidence then yes that's how we should proceed you know believing in the evidence and that's what I like about the Lakes 380 program is that we're collecting these background data from which to really be able to make informed recommendations as to what might go on. Informed on the evidence that's been collected during the, um, during the Lakes 380 program because before that, I mean, this, this was a big difficulty we were up against in New Zealand. We had no baseline data against which to determine whether things had become worse or better or just what was going on even in many of our lakes and waterways. Mm. Have, have been my passion but I think the crux of it is that we as New Zealanders do not value our lakes enough we need I think a lot of us need to step back and think in my case it came 
to me when I realised, well, there was that question going on um, a few years ago, what it is to be a New Zealander. And I was on a panel and everyone was sort of giving answers. Oh, it's the rugby or the, you know, I'm an all black sort of philosophy that is what to them is the most. Others were saying, well, it's a number eight wire mentality we have in New Zealand that makes me a New Zealander. And I said something that everyone sort of looked a bit askance at, but I had been thinking about it. And I thought, when I've been living overseas and would get nostalgic or sort of homesick about New Zealand, well, what, what was it? And I would think it is our lakes and our mountains to me, that's what it is to be a New Zealander, is to sort of be near those and to think of them almost as a part of me, those lakes and mountains. That's what I value most. And then I wondered about whether other New Zealanders sort of realise that lakes are what a lot of them think of for their recreation. It's what the tourism industry actually relies on an awful lot in New Zealand. They don't realise it. I mean, they might have ski fields and they might have um, jet skiing and things like that. But where is this occurring? There's a lake in the picture. It's, it's Lake Wakatipu is very much a part of going to Queenstown, why people go to Queenstown. Lake Wanaka, why they go to Wanaka. They may think they're going for skiing, or, you know, that's just sort of what they think about. But it wouldn't be the same if there wasn't that lake there. They go for holidays, they picnic, they do, it's all part of that. And then it's also very much um, a part of the artwork that we have in New Zealand. The exhibitions of photography, painting, even some of the sculpture. I mean, I've got a little one myself that's the waves. It's part of the sort of the, I like to think of it as part of the Koro design, although I know that's meant to be a curving, um, a curving leaf unfolding, a fern leaf. But nevertheless, Māori have a very close association with water and with lakes. They own the bottom of the lake bed of, of many lakes in the North Island. They're very precious to them. They use lakes to, in the North Island <laughs> with the hot springs to cook their food. They've got myths and legends that involve lakes. For Even for Pākehā New Zealanders, you know, they, lakes are very much a part of their spiritual, their cultural psyche. And I think if we put more value on aspects like that, we would realise why lakes are very important and why they need to have more prominence in thinking, care, attention and management and understanding initially, which is what the Lakes 380 is helping do. Just inland from Lake Wakatipu, right on the tops there, there were some quite high lakes that were discovered. I was on one of those surveys and, and when I was looking at the samples of the zooplankton and thought, these don't look quite right, or at least they look different. It's very odd. And so then um, I decided to sample these lakes. Very difficult to sample because you couldn't get up there very easily and then, then when you got up there, you, you know, to have a boat and everything. To cut a long story short, I paid for a helicopter and, and Mark Schellenberg offered to do the sampling, which was done from the helicopter <laughs> and samples and brought them back and I looked at these Daphnia and realised that they, they really were different. So I started to describe them and I wrote a paper about them, but then I wanted to name the species, or at least, you know, that was the next step. New Zealand Geographic Board, they had sanctioned the Māori names for the South Island and the North Island. 
in the South Island was Te Punamu. And I thought, wouldn't that be perfect? Because this is only found in the South Island, to my knowledge. We've checked other high lakes along the um, Southern Alps. So I went to our Puheri Tangata, and our, um, who was for our department, and said, what would you think if I, you know, suggested this name? Would would you be, you know, would it? How does it fit with um, um, Maori? And he, oh, he said, I think it's wonderful. And so I thought, I don't care whether the rest of the world internationally can't pronounce this name. It's not as complex as a lot of the ones they, you know, give give um, species. It would be Te Waipunamu, Daphnia Te Waipunamu. It's a cute little Daphnia. It is. It's sort of round and got a little turned up nose and its eye in the middle. It's very endearing. I mean, there are other ones that have big Roman noses and look very severe, but this one is cute. With respect to the um, uh, professorship that I've set up in freshwater sciences, I've actually been thinking about that, saving towards it for the last 20 years. A good professor in that area will be someone who can not only help teach and bring in um, new students and get them enthused, but be enthusiastic about f lakes bring in new research students, lead research programs, do everything we can to um, improve and extend the um, conservation and the wise management of our lakes and rivers based on, based on evidence-based research. Yeah. I would love to see us. Well, secretly, actually, I would love this eventually to develop into an, an institute or centre of freshwater studies here. I'll be long gone by then, but you know, it's nice to have these dreams.